And I'll praise when I do I'll praise cause I know You're still in control Cause my praise is a weapon It's more than a sound Pastor here, and this is Miss Lee Bird. I am the Mom's Day Out director. We have a great new program called Mom's Day Out, and she directs and leads that so wonderfully. So, if you need any information on our Mom's Day Out program, make sure that you see Miss Lee. Uh, we have had an awesome series that was kicked off last week on feelings, and Pastor really introduced that due season and waiting and that happening. And so, that may have really impressed some of your hearts. So, on the back of this card, if you're new here on the front of this card, make sure you fill this out. We really want some information to connect out to you. But on the back, there's also some information that you may have really felt the Lord pulling at your heart on things to do, ways to serve. So make sure you see that along with the prayer requests that are on that too. We also have our newcomers brunch. It is uh, every the first three Sundays, three Sundays yep. of first every three month. Sundays. Um, it's right back here in the offices following immediately after first service. Um, so if you're looking for a good way to get connected and you want to meet our pastoral staff, um, they have wonderful food. And it's also a, just a good opportunity to learn what our church is about. Amen. So that's if you're new here or you've been here and you just really want some more information, that's right next door. And then right after service today, both services, who loves to eat? We're the Edomites sometimes, right? Yes. So we make sure we have a taco sale in the back, a taco bar. You come and join us. All those funds are going to go towards our last push for Kiss Fest, which is our first year ever, which we're really excited about. But we also want to make sure we push those 
last minute pennies in for these babies to get into, get up to Kids Fest. So join us there. And then we also will have a cake auction outside under the awning if you would like to take a cake home with you today. Ladies, May 10th, we have our Dorn Conference coming up. It is for Mother's Day, but all women are welcome. It starts at 6.30 p.m. We will have a guest speaker, Hannah Cruz. Um, if you register online, you will get a free book. Yes, we have that book today, and we'll show it here. Right, beautiful, right there. That book, right there, if you register online. Anyone who registers online will receive a free devotional called Goodness Gracious. Is that not just the best thing for us? Goodness gracious. But it talks about the goodness of God, and it's a devotional that you really want to be a part of. So make sure if you register, register online. What else will be there, Miss Lee? Some boutiques? Yes, we will have boutiques. We will have holy grounds here. Um, and what else is coming? What All else good stuff. Coming? Yeah. The Lord stuff. will definitely be here. That's the most important That's part. Right. So That's make right. sure you come for that. Can I do just one little plug Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Um, Make sure you see you this know, beautiful first lady here for the I'm so excited about it. this. First off, tacos, tacos, tacos. I'm so excited about that today for sure because I don't have to cook. Um, but this is a ladies' conference. This is the first year we've actually turned it into a conference. We used to do a Mother's Day dinner, so I'm super excited. There is a charge for it. Um, it is $40, but like she said, I, I'm going to order 300 of these. So hopefully 300 of you will register online. Um to get and this lady coming is just so much joy and so much encouragement so invite anybody it's from ages 10 and up is that what we said ages 10 and up and it'll be, we'll have some munchies out here we'll have holy grounds who is an awesome local coffee company and then some local boutiques and i know she said all that but i'm just like so excited so i had to interrupt their announcement so these ladies aren't they amazing that oh, way. Damn, i love her we really are excited about the ladies' conference. We really are. We are just like shaking in our boots. I'm for ready. I'm so, ready. One last announcement is we have graduation Sunday that is coming up on May the 5th. And so if you have a high school senior or college senior that is graduating and would like uh, for that to be honored and recognized on that Sunday, make sure you see Pastor Corey or, or Pastor Clayton for a form on those. They will have those for you if you would like to. So. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your house to worship. God, we just love on you today. God, we meet you here. And Lord, we know that you're going to do great and mighty things, Lord, just for the, the faith that we have to show up and, and be a part of this service with you today. God, I just pray right now that our ears and hearts will be open to the word. God, the fresh word that you have for us and let us take it out, Lord, to be lights and show our feelings to the world. In your name we pray. Everybody says.
phrase right there, it says, surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me. That's straight from scripture. What an amazing thing to sing out loud and worship our Savior this morning. It's straight scripture to sing over our lives. Lord, we come to you right now, Father, and we just thank you for already being in the room with us, God. Already changing hearts and touching lives, Father. Whatever you have for us, God, we don't want to miss it, Father. We want to go where you go, God. We want to stay right where you are. Surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And we submit to every plan that you have for us, God. We don't want to go without you, God. We don't want to be without you, God. We don't want to be any place where you're not, Father. Make sure we're in the dead center of your will for us, Father. We submit to that.
This song this morning is a song really of thanksgiving. It's thankfulness. I don't know if you stopped for a moment lately and thought of where you would be today if God not had intervened in your life. I don't like thinking like that, but every time we need to. We need to. Because then it will remind us of where we are today and we can give thanks for all the goodness that he's given to us. Come on. Right? Right? I love the part that says, I can't imagine what life would be. My, my, my. God's good. He's good. He's good. So today, I'm telling you, today, let's give God thanks. You ready? Give him thanks right now in Jesus' name. Today, Father, we come to you in the unbelievable name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Lord, I'm humbled today that you would think enough of us to do what you have done for us. Lord, the message of Easter still rings so strong in our lives today, Lord. And God, I thank you, Father. And I ask that today, Lord Jesus, that you would do a great and a mighty work among us. I thank you, Lord, for you for all that you've already accomplished, but what you want to do in this place today. I pray that people will be receptive to your word today. Lord, let, let it not be of enticing words of man's wisdom, but let there be a demonstration of the power of God today as people respond to the supernatural as Jesus reaches his hand out to mankind today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Turn around to someone, if you would, please. And Welcome them to church this morning. You can, you can have your seat. Amen.
wasn't going to bring Sam. Sam's walking out with the praise team right now. But the other day we were talking, Friday night we had a bunch of college kids, young adults that came in into the, the house here and, and worshiped the Lord. It was absolutely incredible. And we were talking afterwards, and she said something to me that, that really resounded. Uh, she said, she says, Pastor, I'm trying to learn how to not to always be in my feelings, but to live a life of faith, which is never based on my feeling. And I thought to myself, someone's been listening to the preaching, right? Last week, we talked about the, the feelings of weariness and growing weary and how it's a process. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves in a spot to where we want to give up and we want to quit. Well, today we're still in that valley, and today we're going to look in the, the valley of doubt and the wilderness that comes in the season of doubt. When you start talking about feelings, it's, it's very easy for me to, to think of songs that have the word feelings in it. I'm not going to sing the song that some of you are thinking about. You've got to be my age or a little older. Feelings. Oh, oh. Feelings. Right? You can't get away from them. They're part of who we are. In fact, when I was, when I was a, a teenager many moons ago, Yes, many moons ago. I would sing all the time because there was, there was nobody else in the church that would sing. And they, they made me do it uh, Saturday, last night. They called me on. Come on, little Richie, get up here and sing. I said, I heard you say little Richie. I heard you say that. But my, me and my family would get up, and we are not a singing family. Oh, Lord is right, Mama. My mom and sister's here. And we'd sing the song, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Anybody remember that song? Just raise your hand if you remember that song. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. It's okay. YouTube it. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. It's incredible, right? But we as humans and especially as spirit-filled believers, man, we get in our feelings. Because we are an emotional kind of people. And a lot of times we thrive or we die in our feelings. We'll be on the mountaintop one day and everything's good. The birds are even singing our favorite song. And then something happens and we're so low that you look up and you see the bottom of a snake, right? I mean, you're low. You're as low as it can go. So it's human nature for us to, to, to go through these highs and these lows, but God is consistent and wants in our lives to be very consistent. Not that we're going to have moments, and we will. You're going to have moments where your emotions are going to get the best of you. When you're, you're going to be so in your feelings, you can't even find yourself, right? But when we come into seasons of doubt and weariness, we have to understand one thing, that it's, 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 not, it's not a big issue to doubt. It's a big issue to live in doubt. Whether it's a feeling, emotion, or it's part of your character, you have to really, and only you can answer that through the scriptures and through the Lord. But we have to filter that today as we look in this wilderness of doubt. Probably one of the most popular besides Jesus characters in the Bible, figures in the Bible, is Moses. And we're going to look at Moses today, but before we begin, I'm going to ask that, that the Lord opens our ears today to hear what he wants to say through his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, I love you and I thank you. Lord, as we come to this time, this critical, crucial time of service when we gather together, Lord, may it not, never just be entertainment, but let it be life-changing. As we know that your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. I thank you for your word today. Let your word pierce us and heal us at the same time. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So when we think of Moses, we think of Moses, baby. Man, I have all these songs just going through my head. I don't know what it's, maybe it's springtime, I don't know. Moses in the bull or something, you know. I can hear fearless David in his sling, right? And Moses, little baby Moses. Moses. Moses put in the basket. Moses put in the river. Moses escapes death as an infant. Moses has God's blessing on him as a baby. Moses should have died. Moses should have never been. But God had a plan for Moses from the very beginning. Right? Moses is then raised primarily by his mother until it's time to go to Egypt. And he is raised along with the princelings, right? All the princes, he's, he's, he's raised with them as one of them. He's a Hebrew boy, but looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. <laughs> I set you up right there. You were already there. I took you right there, right? Man, he's got the garb. He's got the term. The Lord is working, I'm telling you. It's been a crazy week, y'all. It's been a crazy week. He's got everything that would say and scream, I am an Egyptian, right? We see him in the basket. We hear about him when he's just little, little, and then we hear nothing of Moses until he's an adult. And we're introduced to him as an adult, and how we're introduced to him is very strange. And there was Moses, and two were fighting. One was an Israelite, one was an Egyptian. Moses intervenes because apparently the Egyptian was whooping the Israelite. Moses intervenes and kills the Egyptian. Kills him so much that he buries him in the sand. Covers it up. He does. Goes about his business. I have taken care of my kinfolk. I have taken care of, of Israel. And I have extinguished an Egyptian. All is good. He goes home. The next day, two Egyptians are fighting. Right? And then two, two Israelites are fighting. And he goes to break them up, and they say, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian. And so Moses then runs for his life. He does. Because Pharaoh said, I'm coming after him. He killed one of ours. I'm going to kill him. And then he, he, he escapes to a very weird place. He goes to uh, a place, uh, they call it Midian, and there's the priest there of Midian who has seven daughters, and, and he goes to that place to hide. It's in the mountain region. It's a very hard place to get to. and Not many people would look there. No one would really even go there, so he goes to hide. And he is hiding there from fear of being killed. Now, what ends up happening is that Moses loves to help those that are oppressed, those that are getting mistreated, those that um, are being abused. So he, he, the Bible says that he goes to the land of Midian and he camps there by a well. Weird to me, though, because a, uh, the well was the, really one of the center of town. All the roads would lead to the well because that was the source of water. And, I, and, and God hasn't given me any revelation yet on why he would go to the well except for this one point. He saw daughters of Jethro. Now, when you read this account, you'll, you'll hear that his father-in-law, and I'm fast forward, his father-in-law goes by like five different names. So it's really strange to understand why he's called Raul in one part and Jethro in another. But it's really, when you think about it, it was the culture. It was maybe their, their clan name or Maybe it was a nickname, or maybe it was a family name, but we know that, that the, the Jethro, the, the priest of Midian, has seven daughters, and they come to get water for all of their animals. Well, there's other shepherds there that are taking up and hogging the well. Moses sees it and says, I'm coming to defend those ladies. I'm going to take care of business. 
Moses must have been a striking dude. I mean, he, he went and he just, whew. the Bible said that not only did he, did he get the water for and draw the water, but he made sure that their flock was safe. He made sure they got back home. The, and the girls get back home and tell their dad of all that happened. And dad says, why did you leave him there? Well, that's right. Some parents, you know, when a good guy comes along, you better snatch him up. Right? He said, well, I got seven of you. Surely one of you would like him. Right? And apparently, Sephora did. And they, they had, a, had a son named Gershon. But anyway, so they get to, they, they, he gets into the family, right? And then he becomes a shepherd. Moses. Destined by God for great things, saved miraculously from death as a baby, makes a mistake, kills an Egyptian, runs for his life, finds himself in a place where he can help other people. He begins to help other people. He ends up find, finding a wife and a family, and life is going really good for Moses. Moses stays in Midian for 40 years. Because we don't hear much about him until the burning bush. Moses is 80 years old when he has the encounter with God on Mount Sinai there in the land of Midian. God gets his attention. See, the king of Egypt had died. A generation had passed. And now God was calling Moses for something incredible in the new day that he was about to live. Very tough to understand life and understand God and understand what God wants to do, especially when you have exited God's plan and you have traveled far from him and then you have set up camp in a place of obscurity And you've waited a whole generation to do something for the Lord. Today, I'm telling you, the Lord has really kind of got me all over the place today with this message. We cannot afford in 2024 to miss a generation. We cannot afford because of our mistakes and our hiding and maybe even our embarrassment or our fear. We cannot allow ourselves to be in the way of what God would have to do. Now, the Bible says, and we're going to read it in just a moment, but the Bible says that the cry of the, of the people of Israel, see, they were in bondage to Egypt. Over 400 years, they've been in bondage to Egypt. If you remember, they got to Egypt because of the famine that was in the land and the son of Jacob, which is Joseph, coat of many colors, was sold into slavery. He goes into Egypt. God elevates him to a place of deliverance for God's people. And then Jacob and all the sons, they came to Joseph. And Joseph saved them. But the Bible says there arose a king that knew not of Joseph. And when he knew not of Joseph, what did he end up doing? He he ended up, because the, the Israelites had been multiplying in number, their strengths had gotten better, they were of fearful people, really, in a moment, they could turn on the Egyptians and overtake them, but they never would do that, but they could if they wanted to. Then the the kings of Egypt got fearful of that, so what did they do? They said, okay, we're not going to give you uh, any more supplies to make bricks. You're going to have to figure out how to make it without the supplies. We're going to make your days, instead of 10-hour days, we're going to make them 20-hour days. We're not even going to allow you to sleep. If you stop, we're going to whip you on the back. We're going to Whip your children. We're going to make life horrible for you to keep you beat down, to keep you pressed down, to keep you from coming up against us. And God told Moses, now I'm getting ahead of myself, but God told Moses that he had heard the cry of the children of Israel and that it was time to do something. Exodus chapter 3 Verses 1 through 12. If, you, if, you, if it's been a while since you've read the account in Exodus or the book of Exodus, it is incredible. You need to read it. And it reads like this. It says, one day Moses 
was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, who was the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it did not burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why is it that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. Moses replied, here I am. The Lord warned him, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land in a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. He said, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God. He said, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. See, Moses is minding his business, doing what he needs to do to provide for his family, right? He's been there 40, almost 40 years now. Life is good. He takes this flock through a wasteland, a desert place, if you would, where there are no inhabitants. He gets the flock away from everything else, and he comes to the mountain in the midst of the wilderness, and then God speaks to him. Two generations had passed from the time that Moses was born to the time that he left to the time now that God is calling him to return. But he hears the heart of God for deliverance. The heart of God is still to deliver people from oppression of sin, from oppression of self. God's heart is still in the delivering business. Is that God wants to deliver you, whatever you're dealing with and going through, it doesn't have to be normal for you. You can be delivered from that and set free. You can. You can. The message of God sometimes comes in the lonely places of life, in the wilderness, in the desert, by himself, with just a bunch of animals. You might feel that about your life, that you're alone by yourself in the midst of a bunch of animals, right? It's in that lonely place that God gets our attention. It's in that lonely place that God gets our attention. God often brings his people through wilderness moments. He does. He does. I mean, think about it. Moses is 40 years in the desert following the murder of the Egyptian taskmaster. It reminds us this morning that wilderness moments are not banishment by God, but could be, very well could be part of God's great story in your life. Moses should have died, but God's grace Stepped in. 
One writer says, the wilderness place in the biblical story is never simply a place of abandonment. When Hagar ran from the abuse of her mistress, Sarah, it's in the wilderness that she met the Lord, whom she God, the, who she called the God who sees me. Fast forward in this account, when the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt, and they were in the wilderness of the wanderings, and they were tested by God and, and reoriented toward them to God, it was in those moments that God provided for them, when their resources were limited, when they didn't have anything to eat or anything to drink, the supernatural provision of God happened in the wilderness moment. Wilderness moments are not always God's mad at you. Wilderness moments are not always God is, is angry with you. Oh, no. It very well, very well could be the moment where you are about to see the goodness and the graciousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because God will always get your attention. He will get your attention. Moses is doing his own thing, has never given one indication in Scripture that he wanted to go back to Israel, although deep inside of him was a longing to help people that were being tormented tortured, and oppressed. He had had the track record of that. But we don't see in Scripture that he really ever really wanted to go until God began to speak. and God got his attention in a bush that was burning but not consuming. I love that God said, wait a minute, Moses, stop. Don't come any closer. Don't get, don't, don't get much closer, Moses, for the place that you're standing is holy. In other words, where you're standing right now, there's about to be some words spoken that are holy, that are true, and that will come forth. Because God always gives clear directive. When he stops to get your attention, he gives you clear directive. Now, some people say, well, God, God you got my attention, but you ain't telling me what to do. Oh, I beg to differ. Oh, he knows, he's already told you. You just haven't accepted it. He's already speaking to you. He's, he's already told you what you need to do, but you're not doing it. It's not that he hasn't spoken. It's not that you're, you're not willing to do what he has said that he was going to do. Well, I don't know about that, preacher. I, 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 I don't know about that. Let me tell you, when God gets your attention, he never remains silent. When God gets your attention, it's for something big. When God gets your attention, it's for something supernatural. When God gets your attention, we need to stop. And we need to connect ourselves to his holiness. He says, take your sandals off your feet, Moses. What, what do you mean? I don't want anything between me and you because the place you're standing right now is holy. So I, I'm about to touch you right now, and you're about to touch me. You're about to understand what I want for your life. Two generations have passed, but no time to wait any longer. I have remembered my covenant with your father, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not that God had forgotten it, but, it, but it's better rendered as this. I know now is the time for me to deliver my people. I'm just going to pause right here. I just felt a prompting of the Spirit. Your cry is being heard by God, and he is never inactive. He is an active God. He made you a promise. It's not that he's forgotten it, but the timing hasn't been right. And I believe through the power of the Spirit today, the timing is right. Begin to look. Man, I sense his presence today. Begin to look beyond your circumstances into the faith and the face of God as he delivers to you what he has promised. Somebody give God praise today. Amen. Man. He said to Moses, he said, I'm sending you. You're sending me. No, I ain't going. No, I'm sending you. Then Moses, for some reason, was never a man of doubt, but doubt entered into Moses' life. 
when he had a clear directive from God. When Moses puts all of his doubts before the Lord at the burning bush, and he does. See, the key to the situation this morning was not who Moses was and what he could bring to the task in hand. That's our human response. God gets our attention. God gives a a directive. And then we begin to filter the, the directive through our ability. See, the Lord changes the focus of Moses' thinking from self to God, from Moses' human ability to God's divine potential. Think about it. Moses says, I can't go there. They want to kill me. I can't go there. I have a heavy mouth, a strong tongue. I can't speak well. I can't tell these people. I didn't know what to tell them. What am I going to go in there and say? This burning bush figure told me what to do. What am I going to do? And God changes it. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do. You're going to go in and says, the I am sent you. The God of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Japheth had spoken to you. He is the I am, and he has sent me because you are going to be freed from bondage. Moses is probably thinking, well, I, I killed one Egyptian. I ran off all those shepherds. There's no way I can handle the whole Egyptian army. And God is saying, respond to me. Respond to me. And I'll remove doubt from your heart. See, it's our human nature to doubt our ability. Right? I mean, only a few people that have really good self-confidence would jump in at something like this. Moses is by himself. He doesn't have an army with him. He has a direct or a directive from God to just go and tell Pharaoh, let God's people go. It's our human nature to say, God's giving me a directive, but there's, I can't do it. I feel God, God's got my attention. He's giving me a directive, and that directive is I need to turn my life over to him. God, you've got my attention. What you want me to do? I hear people say that all the time. Well, number one is respond yes to him. And that's what Moses had to do. He had to say yes to God. And saying yes to God seems to be very very simple, but yet very hard at the same time. Because it's with the yes that then doubt is removed. It's with the yes, then faith is built up. It's with that yes that I will, that your will then crumbles and his will then grows, right? Because God always wants a decision. My dad told me this when I was, when I was a teenager. He said, son, man, life's about choices. Just make one. Don't live in this doubt, in in a life of indecision, make a decision because God wants you to make a decision. We say this all the time. This is really a fundamental phrase in the Christian world is for us to have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with God, and it's kind of what we do as humans too. We have a relationship with someone else. We bring all of these expectations our own expectations of what this relationship is supposed to look like, we bring it to the table. And that creates in us a system, if you would, of how things should operate. Well, I'm bringing my expectations to this. I hear people say all the time, well, Pastor, I didn't expect the relationship to go like this. Well, I didn't expect, let's just go ahead and say it, I didn't expect marriage to be this hard. I didn't expect this, or I didn't expect this job to be this way, or I didn't expect life to be this way. We bring our own desires, our own expectations to the relationship. And I'm afraid that we do the same thing with God. Maybe we bring our past traditions, our past religion, I don't know, 
But we bring these expectations. Maybe it's something we've heard our whole life that's not biblical at all. But we bring all these expectations to God. And then when it doesn't work out, we're out. Well, God, you must not be God. God, you must not be the one who really wants to take care of me. Because when God doesn't perform the way we think that he should perform, we get frustrated. And then we begin to doubt his loyalty to us and how strong his relationship is with us. And we make it about ourselves. But I'm telling you, as your pastor today, our relationship with God is not about meeting our expectations. It's always about meeting his expectations. Right? And when he doesn't meet our expectations, it's okay. We don't doubt him. We trust him. Because our relationship with God is about God himself shaping us, shaping our desires, shaping our perspective, shaping our understanding of life to his will and learning how to trust him. And that's what Moses had to do in the moment as he's speaking to the bush and it's crying back out to him. He had to put his 80 years of mistakes, his 80 years of wanderings, his 80 years of wilderness, his 80 years of not doing what God really wanted him to do with his life. God gets his attention, gives him a direction, and then asks him for a decision. And in order to make the decision, we have to understand that God has your best interest in in heart and he wants to shape your desires, shape your perspective, shape your understanding so that we can learn to trust him. We sang songs today. I don't want to go without you. You have great plans for me, Lord. You do. But Lord, I'm not doubting you. I'm doubting me. And I believe that's where Moses was. So God said, don't worry. I always, always qualify the called. Always. Always. He says, so Moses, when you go in there, take the rod. Perform the miraculous miracles. Moses, when you go in there, tell them this, tell them that. God always gives directive, and he always wants a decision. You might be saying today, I'm closing with this. You might be saying today, I just can't say yes to God. If I say yes to God, then this will have to change, and this will have to change, and this will have to change, and this will have to change. As they're coming up and getting ready to play a little bit, Sister Nancy, I'm going to talk about your husband for a moment, just real quick. I know if most of you know Brother Terrell. Terrell's a great man. Love him. We had a senior adult function one time on a Friday night, and I happened to mention that I didn't have any deer meat to cook for the next morning at men's breakfast. I was just going to go and to Walmart and buy something. Next thing I know, I went home and got ready for bed, and the, the doorbell camera went off in, in the house, and before I could get up there, he had, Brother Terrell had brought me about six pounds of, of deer sausage to cook for the men's breakfast. It was way too much. It was awesome. Whew, I think we sinned a little bit that day. But before he could leave, he tripped, and I didn't see it till afterwards. He had tripped outside on our, my sidewalk and rolled about 12 feet and busted himself all up. Knocked himself silly, gets in his car, and somehow makes his way back to his house. Sends a picture. He's all beat up. He said, it was a rough journey, Pastor, but I delivered what God wanted me to deliver. (laughs) Praise him. I'm going to be honest, Sister Nancy. I saw a, a, a seed of faith in that man's heart that night. That was six, eight months ago, maybe. We're at a funeral this week for... Kathy Porter and her family, y'all please remember them in prayer. And we're shaking hands with everybody as they're walking out. And Brother Terrell came up to me. He said, you said something on Easter Sunday that if I gave my life to God, that if anybody gave their life to God, they needed to reach out to you and tell you. I said, yeah. I said, who? He said, I did. How old is your husband? 71 years of age. God got his attention 
God gave him a directive and God gave him the ability to say yes with a decision. Amen? So I talked to him and I talked to him after the funeral and he is just, a, Brother Gerald, isn't he just a different, he's, he's, just, he's just a different guy. I mean, he just, he's, he's just a different man. I'm telling you, I don't know where you're at in your life and I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're full of doubt. Maybe you've been saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Or maybe God has given you a directive, and you're like, there's no way I can do that. Let me tell you, you can. Because it's not your ability. It's his ability through you, right? He never looks at your ability anyway. He always looks at your availability. I know I say that all the time, but I mean it. He looks, make yourself available to him, and Moses had to end up going. And he did. Most of you know the story. God's people were delivered miraculously because one man said yes to the call of God on his life. You might say, I can't. God says, he can through you. So this morning, we're talking about the the initial call, the call to get saved. Some of you, God might have given you a directive to do something for him. Maybe to start a small group at your job. Maybe to witness to a neighbor. Maybe to go on the mission field. Who knows what God is doing in your life. But if God has got your attention, he'll give you a directive. And then you all, all you have to do is make the decision. So would you stand with me this morning? We're going to ask for the greatest decision ever. And that's the decision to give your heart to God completely. If Mr. Terrell at 71 years of age grew up in church, right? His mama, whoo, right? Grew up in church. But it comes upon every man and woman's life that they have to make the decision for themselves, right? He said, I gave my heart to God. Sean, I'm telling you, I can live the rest of this year on that one testimony right there. But today, are you ready? Has God got your attention? Has he told you that it's time, that directive? It's time to move. Sing a song for us as we pray. God has got your attention. And you sense him giving you the direction that it's time for change in your life. It's time to surrender to you, to your will, to his will. It's time to move. And he needs, he wants a decision from you today. Let that decision be a yes decision. Come on, let's pray together. Lord, we love you today. Lord, I thank you today. Lord, thank you for removing doubt. Lord, in the midst of the lonely places in life, the wilderness places in life, Lord God, you speak. Lord, on the side of that mountain, you begin to speak. Moses heard it. Moses responded to it. If God has got your attention and it's time to you to say yes to him and whatever it may be, it might be in salvation, it just might be in obedience. But there's no doubt any longer. This is a confirming word to you today. I invite you to step forward this morning and come down to the front with us. We're going to pray with you today. just to reiterate just a little bit earlier the Lord gave a word right in the middle for those that are that are crying out to him and you feel like it's hitting the heavens and bouncing back down it's not hitting the heavens it's hitting like a wall and then he says he remembers again it's not that he's forgotten but he says the time is now 
to be expecting the deliverance of Jesus to happen in your life in the next few days. Amen. Be expecting God to do something incredible. God gave word last week. Remember, it was a, I, I need to go back and listen to it, but it was a two week, in two weeks, and two, he kept saying, in two weeks, in two weeks. So hang in there, child of God. Don't doubt him. Even though you might live in the doubt of yourself, don't doubt him. He is more than able, more than capable of tending to you. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you today. God, I thank you. Lord, I sense a deep movement of your presence in this place today. Lord, almost where people are, Lord, even fearful to move at where they're from, where they're standing. Almost like Moses, where God said, that's an if right there. Lord, I thank you that today that we have removed the flesh. Lord God, and now we're standing on holy ground. Lord, you've got our attention. You've given the directive today. And I thank you for the ones in the room and those watching online today that have said, God, you can have all of me. I will do what you want me to do. My life now is yours. God, I give you thanks for that. Lord, I thank you for the delivering power of your presence today. I thank you, dear God. Those that have been oppressed, those that have been beat down, those, God, that have been mistreated, I thank you that you are doing something great. Lord God, you will get all the glory and the honor and the praise for it. Lord, we give you thanks for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give it a motivational praise with our hands, amen. You may be seated for just a moment. Real quick, I, I'm going to invite some of the students to come up real quick. They're going to give, give about 20 seconds, maybe 10, Luke, maybe two. On the importance of youth camp. We have a youth camp in our denomination in Springville, Alabama. And that camp has, has, I've been a part of that camp since the year 2000. Almost 20, this year be a, a, really the 25th year that I've been at that camp. And you'll see that, wow, that's a crazy picture. We we'll bring that up. Okay, there's another one, right? These are our students at camp. And go ahead and put up uh, the picture of the building. They have built this building this year at the camp, and the building's complete. It's just lacking. Uh, that 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 building is uh, a building has 11, 11 rooms uh, for staff and kitchen workers and stuff like that. Um, we committed this week to furnish one of the rooms, to put the furnishing in one of the rooms. It's a $4,000 commitment. We committed to that this week. I felt impressed with the Lord, and the Lord told me, to just tell you about it. You know we don't come up here and ask for money. We know that God supplies the needs. He does that. But it's we're, we sent off a check this week for $4,000 to to furnish one of the rooms that can't, in, in that new building. Uh, that goes in line with what we're doing for, our, for the building here. Build it there. God told us, build the house. We built the house in Guatemala, right? Build the house somewhere else and God will build ours and he's already doing that. Let me tell you why. You ready for this? Can I go ahead and show you this? We sent the check off on Tuesday. I told Kristen to write the check on Tuesday. The man that's that's building the, the new awnings on the building, the window coverings on the building, they took off the one on the front of the building because we had to reskin the outside of the front this week. When they took it off, this was another company. When they took it off, they damaged it. The new company comes, and they put up the, the, the window coverings. And I asked him, I said, do you think you can repair that? He said, yeah, I think we can. I said, I'd really like it to, to, to be a little more grand, a little better entrance area. And I said, well, we'll probably do that eventually one day. Go ahead, just fix it and put it up. He calls me Friday afternoon. Well, I called him, left him a detailed message. He just texts me. He says, hey, Richie. I got some ideas on the front canopy to go at, at, on your new church building. I'm going to send you some ideas of what I want to build. 
and I'm going build it, to build it at no cost. That's probably a $12,000 canopy. Each one of those window coverings, this is how much that, that aluminum stuff is, each one of those window coverings at his cost was a lot of money. It was $6,400 for four of them, okay? It's a lot of money, which is half of what someone else wanted to charge for them. So this canopy is probably minimum worth about $12,000. And he said, I'm going to do it for free for the church. Amen? What we have here is fertile ground. If you're not sowing into fertile ground, that's what this is right here. If you're not sowing into fertile ground, you need to sow into fertile ground. All right? God will always bring it forth. So tell me real quick, a, your, a 20 cent, man, you're tall. Brother Billy, get my sling. All right. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. That's uh, A little boy named David went out to fight the giant. Everyone laughed at such a funny little sight. Uh, y'all remember that song? Anyway. That's that song, honey. Remember that? Anyway, real quick, 20 seconds or so. The spiritual impact that Camp Utopia has had on you, and why should these people give in an offering today above their tithe and regular offering for Camp Utopia? It was probably the praise and worship and my faith helped my faith a little bit more, helped me grow closer to God. That's pretty much it. Amen. That's pretty much it. Hey, man, a few words. I love that. I don't know if this is a lady a few words, but here we go. Okay. Lucy, what would you say? Camp is where I felt called into ministry. Oh, wow. And it just kind of like let me put my faith in God and trust his plans in my life. There we go. How about that? Fertile ground. This is fertile ground. Go ahead, kids. Um, okay. I'm a little nervous up here. But I've been going to camp three years. Mm -hmm. I think this is be my fourth year. And the first year, I always felt like I was called to something, but I wasn't really sure just yet. But the first year, he really showed me that my plan was to help people. And every year that I went, he's helped me kind of walk in that and figure out how I'm going to help people in my future. So, yes. That's incredible. So it's not just a camp where they go and you don't have to worry about your student for the whole week. It's actually a spiritual camp, that, and that's what we do at Camp Utopia. It's more spiritually based than recreation based. We put emphasis on the spiritual part of camp. If you would like to donate to help pay for that 4000 or just to put seed in that, right? It's, we've already paid for it, but if you'd like to join in us and let you know that th this place that you give to Crossroads Church, right, is fertile ground. God will bring it back. This is what his word says. Press down, shaking together, running over. Amen. Be faithful with your tithe and your offering. Those that have been faithful with their building building fund pledges, thank you so much. I'm going to tell you, things are going, going great. I had a dream that we, we got to the end of the project, and we had $600,000, $700,000 left. I, I came to everyone and said, listen, we've had $900,000 donated or given, and we walked out of here debt-free. Someone stood up, and a, a group of people stood up and said, we'll take it. It's over. Don't worry about it, Pastor. It's taken care of. God's already paying for this building, and I, I just urge you to get involved in this as well. You won't regret it, I promise. But let's pray over the offering. Ushers, if you'll make your way to the back. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and greatness. I thank you, God, for all that you've done. Lord, we just humble today that you got our attention. You've given us directive. And, Lord God, today we've made the decision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. We love you.